This episode of Startup Project is brought to you by Bear.tax. Bear.tax compels all your crypto transactions and makes it easy for you to file your taxes. Check out Bear.tax. That is B A R T A X. Bear.tax. Hey, Ajay, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Ajay. So, one of the interesting things uh, with, the, with doing a podcast is like you you have familiar people as your guests, and then you can ask them questions that you would otherwise not ask. uh in a regular conversation so i thought an interesting place to start is to talk about you know your journey from india to us i think i never asked you about you know how your journey started before roomy uh your first company so i think that would be a good place to start you know how and when you came to us and you know what was your journey before roomy like uh man i mean i think kind of crazy right i mean every entrepreneur would would want to say of course failures <laughs> before anything but um i actually did fail in uh, i failed in my high school twice that's the setting the stage for me kind of moving to the states um so senior high school you know 12th grade in india so i failed twice and third time sort of my dad was like fed up and he kind of knew i think that um you know it was hard to compete i mean i was in like the z iit programs when you know i think and he was like you know if you if you um finally uh, pass you know then uh, hopefully you should just go out basically and that was the state so i finally uh, passed my senior high school by a margin applied to bunch of schools luckily got in and yeah moved to the state man that was almost damn 16 plus years ago um for computer science uh, undergrad program so you moved uh, as a student Yes, I did. Yes, got it. And uh, so let's talk about Rumi, your first company, right? Uh, how did the you know idea came, and uh, was this in college or post college? Rumi was, um, you know, when I first moved out here, I remember two thousand six ish, two thousand seven actually. I I started um, tinkering with a bunch of ideas, and I actually built the first uh, like a dev shop, you know, from India, and then the building. uh this websites for the people so basically i was in the states so here in new york i would go around like gyms you know local gyms and ask them hey if they don't have a website i'll build one for them that's how i started building kind of like the website and from the website and the building like 200 projects and um built like a whole kind of company around it uh and then a couple of years in played with a bunch of ideas and then build an online classifieds company so i built actually a replica or let's say was trying to copy craigslist but of course a much better version like soleka.com or something in india i did that for for a while and rumi i'd say was like my kind of first real uh and like venture back tip venture back typical kind of like a startup you would imagine yes that was the first one end up working on it in 2012 and it kind of came from my own pain points of you know finding a roommate you know looking at a bunch of you know profiles of visiting places and trying to figure out who's the right fit and build that um and ran that for roughly 9 years yeah so one of the things i think in one of our conversations is where you mentioned you know the fundraising part of rumi uh, and obviously now you're uh, doing simplified uh, post rumi how was it different from you know raising funds for rumi versus now raising for uh, you know you know venture capital for simplified you know i think out of i mean overall i think everything is different you know when they say first time founders versus the repeat founders and who've done this before basically the statement is right you you make a lot of mistakes and i made ton of mistakes more than i can even remember and raising capital was one of them you know i think sort of like the had no idea no connection no network so i pitched to hundreds and hundreds of people before i got my first check and it was always like this begging for money always just getting out there always pitching and the kind of the approach was it's like almost like you can how many doors uh can you like knock on right like that's the approach like if you i pitch 1000 people hopefully i'll find like 10 or 20 that believe in me and the company and they'll give me the money so that was the approach for me very very different than what i'm doing now as a guy um yeah so it's brutal uh time taking i was always raising capital so it just always takes the space uh operating versus capital it's always like operating and capital in this super hard just purely talking about the landscape right like what has changed in terms of the landscape 
according to your perspective from then to now? You know, I mean, this time raising capital for Simplified has been, I wouldn't say like easier or easy, but I think it's been a different experience, you know, and I think it's because of repeat founders who've done this before, made a lot of mistakes before and built a network, right? Like we know people. And I think what we have shown people, what we can do, you know, if we can, can we operate? So I think there's a lot of money out there for absolutely, of course, like new founders and new ideas and new start. But also there's a lot of money for repeat founders. I think, I, and I see as a repeat founder, it's just a little bit easier than the first time because of the network you have. And you can prove yourself, you can execute it faster, right? You, at the end of the day, you can show, I can, I have an idea and I can get it done. But there's definitely too much money out there. And we're seeing like, you know, um, all types of VCs, right? The brand new VCs coming out. One of the biggest changes I've seen is like a single GP, right? <laughs> like never saw that before. Single GP funds and these indie funds coming out. A lot of the founder-led funds are coming out. I mean, Angelus has taken over. So there's definitely massive amounts of capital out there to be deployed into different types of companies. Yeah, uh, so I think one of the things with Simplified that I noticed, which is which works really well when companies are raising is the separation of responsibilities. Like for example, this is my observation, like you are sort of forefront uh, and you can correct me if, you're, if I'm wrong, is that you are the forefront of certain things, especially fundraising and sort of the building in public side of Simplified versus I see Katie as uh, the CEO who is you know, focused on the product and you know tech side of things. Uh, and what I have also noticed in, you know, people who raise successfully while building parallelly is this clear separation of uh, responsibilities and in the very early initial team, especially between the, you know, CEO, CFO, CEO. Uh, I mean, the, the terms don't matter that much initially, but the responsibilities and the time management aspect of it and who's good at what, I think that separation, at least for us as investors, uh, was a clear indication which is a good team versus which is a bad team. Um, yeah. yeah, really interesting point you made out here. And I think, you know, so I I was a solo founder all of my life. I mean, so far, three companies uh, just by myself. Not by, like, choice, just by, you know, no resources, basically. I had no idea. I didn't know anyone. So I ended up just building it myself. But being here with the co-founder, I think it's hands down one of the best things uh, given you have the right co-founder. You know, I've known Katie for, we've been friends for a very long time, six, seven years at least. And <clears throat> when we first entered to this to the partnership, we were like, you know what, we should define a swim lane. So I think the same concept you are kind of noting too, that, hey, you know, you know what we're good at. And so it's like a complementary skill, not the same exact skill, even though we have both done almost everything, right? But some things are heavier on one side than the other one. And I think product, naturally has been of course his background and um how you build amazing products on um, for me and the same thing i think on the other side like operating and expanding and raising and of course like uh finance all that kind of stuff right i think been closer to than the other side but um you're right so we're dividing those roles but for fundraising actually what we do we do it together actually because we both bring in the network together but we definitely divide and conquer in terms of like who's taking that meeting, who's taking this meeting. The good thing is whoever we are pitching and if we were pitching from, let's say, you know someone, then I don't have to go in. Like, I know you got this. I think that's the divide and conquer that trust we both have and the partnership we both kind of like have built. Like go and close it. And once they need us both to be there, then we both go and kind of like close the deal, whatnot. But yes, there's very clear separation in what uh, Katie is doing a leading and what am I, I'm doing so we can be more very effective and just execute the, the end goal here just to kind of keep shipping and keep executing and keep telling a story. One of the uh, other interesting things about Simplified and your journey has been you were investor before you know becoming you know co-founder and CEO of Simplified. So when you were sort of evaluating your next gig and what made you think that Simplified is a large opportunity for you to you know you know, be part of, because committing to a new company is sort of, you know, seven to 10 year journey, right? So what was the evaluation process like, you know, uh, in terms of just market size opportunity and is it worth your next seven to 10 years of uh, time? You know, um, 
I actually wasn't planning to join any company at all. You know, I think my move was, I was more actively getting into investing. You know, I had been investing as an angel for a while. And I think the goal was to start something in, in, the, in the fintech space. I love fintech. And I think there's a lot of problems that needs to be solved in the fintech world, you know, access to capital. And I think how people get paid and whatnot. But when simplified, you know, after investing in the company in the first round, I was, of course, closer to it. I was definitely spending more time with Katie. And what I started to realize that this was also the time when, you know, people were telling more stories and consuming more content. And naturally, I think for the past couple of years, I'm really big on like kind of like sharing stories and just building a brand online and kind of sharing a journey. So sharing a journey is like telling a story. And I think Simplified was making it easier for anyone to tell their story by creating content and making it very, very easy to create content at scale as well. And for a very cost effective, in a, in a very cost effective way as well. So I think all those things kind of resonated with me, like personally, and in, in a way kind of to assess the opportunity was the TAM. And I think this is one of the things that I've learned is if you have a good idea, definitely assess, are you playing the big game in a really, really, really big market? And I think, content creation and marketing is a humongous market. I mean, if you look at Adobe and Canva, that was my like two points, like damn, Adobe sitting at 240 billion and it can only go up. It is going up. Canva is barely getting started already at 40 billion. It's only gonna go up, right? Recently, we've seen Miro to click up to all these amazing tools that have kind of come out either to help you create more or manage through like the project management stuff. So man, I just knew it. This is like the opportunity of a lifetime and I think I'm willing to spend not even one, I think two decades of my life with the right partners kind of build this company. I think the way I looked at it is if you just go into web, every second second you're on web, there's an image or a video popping up and that's mm -hmm. where, and every image or video is made by someone somewhere using someone. some tool. <laughs> yeah. So the, the TAM is potentially a percentage of web activity in a whole, right? Because it's not just about marketing anymore, it's about any knowledge worker anyways is indirectly or directly interacting with content in some way. Content has become, you know, purely, you know, there used to be a time when marketing used to be different from a company. So marketing used to be, there's a special operations of marketing, which is not owned by the company itself. Now we are moving more into towards content marketing where everything has to be in a form of a story and, uh, you need tools to tell that story. So I was always imagining this TAM as a percentage of web activity because pretty much any two seconds you're on the web, you're interacting with an image that is manufactured, not by a camera, but by software. So that, that's yes. an interesting way I used to look at uh, even Canva, which I was a big user. Um, and it, it's almost obvious once you start using those tools that where is the need? Um, and yes. sort of Canva led the way and you guys are also doing an amazing job as I see the pro product progression over time. Yeah, definitely, man, you know, and, and you know, one of the other things that, that of course, you know, I've been noticing and we've been noticing is, you know, if you, if you really think about like, especially when I look at like India and Latam and a lot of other countries, right? Even in the US actually, you see that um, there's so many people who have never told the story, who have never created a piece of content ever before. But they are consuming and they're coming online and creating more. I think that is such a massive untapped market. But generally, I think in SMBs and businesses, we're seeing this trend of that everyone is a marketer and everyone is a creator. It's like a new way to sell stuff, new way to tell a story. It's not really selling actually, but telling a story, you know. And and even if you're selling and you're actually creating campaigns, then how do you create those campaigns at the scale with your team, collaborating in real time? So you can do more with less. I think that's the idea of simplified, you know, so you can create more content in less time, a fraction of a cost and do it with your team members, basically. So you, you bought a Canva, right? I mean, one of the things I was uh, thinking about is how do you compete now that, you know, Canva is a, arguably a decent sized player in the game of, you know, marketing and creating content. Are you guys focused on different geographies or different use cases? You know, how are you thinking about competition in general when you're trying to put your product and position your product? You know, such a um, great question. And, you know, the way we kind of look at this on a daily basis is adding value. 
that's our focus. It's not the focus who we're competing with, whatnot, and I'll come back to it. But I think is that, okay, we have seen the sort of the, and this is mostly like post-pandemic, what we're seeing is people are more disconnected than connected. And I think in a virtual world and remote work, and especially work in general, people are trying to build, bring teams and people together so they can collaborate better. And none of these tools are doing it. Tools are doing it. I mean, if you're creating a piece of content, you're using something for design, something for video, something for writing a piece of copy, and then you're publishing it using some other tool, right? That's not bringing people together. Your assets are living in different places. Your teams are living in different silos, tools. You're paying for too many tools, just burning too much money, almost like a SaaS overload. But like, why can't we have just one space, one place where you can come together as all of your teams, all of your different workspaces, all of your different clients in one single space and create and collaborate like never before. So I think kind of a build simplified ground up day one, this DNA of collaboration, teams in general, you know. So that's been the DNA. And I think Canva didn't start with that. I think what Canva has done is impeccable and amazing with just showing people what you can do with a drag and drop editing platform that can like go and help you design anything you want to without being a professional in design. We want to take it further, giving a place to replace all these apps, help you create more content, help you publish more and work with people in real time, but also a lot of automated content. Take it even further to kind of go into recommending content to people. Like, so, hey, I can't think of something. You know, simply if I can help you think of a bunch of ideas that you can either publish instantly or just you can create your own actually. So I think we're kind of going beyond it now where kind of like Canva is today. And we think if we do a good job in just executing and adding value, then we don't have to worry, worry, worry about the competition. We can create our own space. I think what what is uh, talked about Canva is really, you know, sort of the core why I think we've succeeded because there was a point of time creating any image required, you know, complicated tooling. Uh, sort of, you have to learn Photoshop to do a basic image of a, even if you had to have an interesting Twitter handle, uh, sorry, Twitter image. Uh, you had to go through you know, a bunch of tools uh, and learn. You know, I remember doing Photoshop and thinking, I mean, this shouldn't be this hard to do a simple image editing. And I think what really Canva pioneered is this web-based drag and drop tooling and gives us also the abstraction layer at which they showed we should be doing our image editing. I think that's also very interesting because I think Photoshop will still have a place for you know much deeper and complicated editing for an image or a video. Um, but I think the abstraction level at which most of the individuals, marketers, content creators need uh, a tool to exist, I think they've identified that abstraction level in a very, uh, you know, I think they identified it before anyone else identified it and made it web-based. I think that's, that's what really triggered. And you're right, I think from there, you can also think about now how you can integrate with not integrate, but I think you have to sort of think end to end, uh, how do you solve this uh, problem of, you know, having 10 tools? I think any marketing team, if you talk now has at least 10 tools, you know, one for creating content. So you're, I think on point in terms of like collaboration being key. Um, in a way, it almost sort of feels like, you know, what Notion did uh, for, you know, notes because I think they really thought it ground up and that changed in how the abstraction level of sharing and because sharing is a big part of writing anything yes. online, right? Yep. And that sort of was not integrated well in, I think the tool I would say precursor to Notion was Evernote was successful for a time where mobile was coming in. Uh, but then they sort of dropped the ball on, you know, what is the real core use case our users are using, which, will be sharing and why should there be a difference between a web page versus uh, you know a page in Evernote. I think that's where Notion really cracked and that opened up these thousands of user scenarios which Evernote couldn't ever achieve. But it's only possible by just three or four product features to really. Um, yeah, so it's interesting when I always think about simplified as the next version of Canva, like if you improve you take all the good things about Canva and sort of add the layer of recommendations and collaborations and uh, also geographies, because I think there's a aspect of focus of geographies that misses, uh, that is missing today in Canva that I think also where, you know, tools like Simplified can help. Yeah, 
No, definitely all the good things, man. I mean, and, and I think overall, like I think, because content creation has changed. I think that when Adobe started or Canva, I think people used to do things differently, right? They taught the world to do, do this way or that way. And today's world and the next decade, I think you just want to do a lot more with a lot less. And it's time and money, right? And all that stuff. So I think we have a real chance in sort of like helping people achieve those goals. So they don't have to worry about these things and, and they can just tell a good story basically and as fast as they can. Do you think uh, Adobe will make, make an acquisition in this space? Uh, they should, <laughs> you know, uh, I think so. I think, I think recently we saw Vistaprint uh, made and a Crello, they acquired uh, Canva competitor Crello. Mm -hmm. And I think at some point everybody is realizing that creating content and marketing content is a need right you have to you just do this on a daily basis as you said right you're waking up and you're consuming content you wake up you check your phone every piece of thing you see has been created by someone by using some tool basically so when you're looking at this consumption levels and creation levels that means like all these companies who don't have access to creation they want to get access to these companies who can actually help you create so another thing i want to talk to you about is uh this sort of like build in public trend that happens and you use Twitter and LinkedIn pretty effectively in sort of uh, pioneering that, uh, you know, building public and telling the story of Simplified and you do it quite well. So I was wondering, how do you approach the whole sharing your story with Simplified or even, you know, I think you also do a pretty good job of uh, sort of the personal branding side of it. So I was wondering what are your tactics and strategies that you've developed over time? You know, it is, it is inspired. I think I do it now a lot more, but different inspiration behind them. And I think building in public, you know, for every founder out there and everyone who's building something, it's always the, the hardest part is to figure out, oh, how do I get the adoption up and running, right? I mean, you maybe raise capital, maybe you haven't raised money, you're building something really cool and you, you just want people to use it. So you get your friends and family first and then you're like, oh, who's next? And people think, oh, maybe let me get some organic traffic or let me actually buy the traffic, right? By paying, doing some paid ads. So the approach kind of has been, okay, if you tell a story to the right people, or at least just tell a story and hopefully we can find the right people. Then over time, they might be inclined towards kind of feeling like we're part of their journey or they're part of our journey. And they'll end up giving us a shot, using us and spreading the word. So that's been the inspiration behind it. But the second inspiration has been, um, you know, as, as when you're building companies, you have a lot of stress, stress levels are high. You have a lot of things you're dealing with, a lot of fires. And I do think that the one less thing that you can worry about is sort of this, um, dealing with issues, you know, sharing growth numbers and whatnot. If you, but put it all out there in the world and it's public, you know, we're really worrying about how you're doing as a company, you know, you would fix stuff and you would find solutions to problems, but. There's one less thing to worry about. Your employees know it, right? Your partners know it, your community knows it, your friends and family know it. So really there's nothing to really hide. And that gives you a lot of power because that vulnerability kind of attracts the trust of people. And eventually they help you find these solutions that you cannot do it by yourself. So I think that's the approach I've taken. It's still very early. Um, still trying to figure out what's the best way to do it. I do think sometimes maybe even doing like a weekly or monthly video or something like a start video recording and just the whole journey of building the company to share with public. Hopefully when they do it, they can just take some lessons and hopefully it helps them to build the next idea or next company. I think there's a interesting thing with what you're doing is it fits with what your company and product does. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is one thing I don't like about build in public is, uh, I think there are certain companies you should build in private. Not every company has to be built in yeah, public. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But for your company, it makes a lot of sense because you are in content creation space. I think you can crowdsource ideas for your company. You can, I think it is beneficial for a company like yours to do this. And I think you also have the experience of what it means to tell a story. I think that way I feel like you are much better doing when I see other founders doing it. Uh, but tactically speaking, do you approach it? Do you have a system in place where like, you know, I have to do X amount of 
uh, you know, tweets versus posts. Do you have a tactic or a system in place? Yeah, man. Uh, always chat any, and you definitely nailed it. I think that's the way we definitely know that. The, 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 uh, so the foundational level truth to it. If we are a company, help me to create content. Why not we create content and share with the world, right? Like use your own path as well. That's the idea. And I think the for the tactical part, yes, it take, takes a lot of time, man. And I also get help, you know, from time to time to kind of like help me source thoughts or put them down on like scheduling and planning and designing. And then kind of like, it's like a, you spend a weekend or something, or maybe maybe like an hour or something on a, on a weekday. And then you kind of like plan it out basically and the schedule as much as you can. And hopefully the cycle runs, you engage with people. Um, and hopefully it's, it kind of keeps growing and keep telling the story. But yeah, it takes a lot of time actually. Let's switch gears and talk about, uh, you know, Web 3.0 uh, or what people are calling Web 3.0. Because the reason I want to talk about this is because we've seen a lot of chatter about NFTs and NFTs are images, which essentially are created, can be created on Simplified. So are you thinking about, you know, how to, and there have been a lot of founders in the last year who have pivoted their companies into different forms of Web 3 ideas. Are you actively thinking about that sort of a thing or does it make sense for Simplified interacting with any of the crypto technology? Uh, what is the view there? Man, um, interesting one. Um, um, personally, okay, personally, I do love the space. You know, I've been a big early crypto, I think IT adopter and uh, love the space. NFT, I'm following it. I've been slowly testing, experimenting, buying in there one or two to uh, experiment myself. And I definitely love, you know, what people are creating online and be a part of the community and whatnot. At the simplified level, I think, um, I can't tell you really what the plans are, but what I can do tell you that we do see, this is a form of content creation. So we see like, kind of like the, uh, you know, designing something that you wanna share with the world in form of NFT. Definitely is gonna exist. It's definitely gonna be more and more of that. So at some point, we'll have to think about creating these frameworks and tools that kind of makes it easy for anyone to create a piece of art or anything. And that can be, of course, converted into NFT with a single click of a button. So we don't have any plans now to do it. Uh, I personally think a lot about it. I do think that Simplified can play a role in a way where it can help people uh, achieve these goals and share their art with the world, definitely. Um, but we just don't know how, when, what, and if we're gonna do it. But I do see that the platform can play a role in helping people. Yeah, I think pretty much everything you could do around NFT sort of overlaps with Simplified because let's say tomorrow, you know, a content marketer for a company or a creator made a TikTok from Simplified and it goes viral or sort of becomes, you know, uh, like the first ever, tweet or TikTok or whatever content and sort of becomes iconic in its own way, then you would want to create an NFT out of it. And you could create, start creating tools uh, around that content. And you can sort of extend this ideology into multiple SKUs that are available on Simplified today. Uh, so that was my motivation behind asking the question as well. Um, but, uh, as we're, you know, almost uh, towards the end of the podcast, I wanted to ask you the question of, uh, I think you've been a repeat entrepreneur, uh, right? Before Rumi, you were doing websites and then you did Rumi and now you're simplified. Why, why be an entrepreneur? Why can't you just do a um, job? You know, they always the saying, I think there's some saying out there saying that the, once an entrepreneur is always an entrepreneur. I mean, I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs I and mean, I've seen my dad struggle for decades, you know, just to building his thing that he loved, failing at it miserably, and then hopefully finding some success at some point in his life. Um, so been around, uh, grew up like this with a lot of risk and appetite for that. And I think just love solving problems. That's what it is. And um, it's just always a lot of fun. I think a job, I don't think I'm a good employee to be hired. I think I'll get bored very quickly. And, you know, I'm not, creating, adding a lot of value to the world just by being at a job. I think creating and solving problems at scale and helping hopefully a lot of people along the way is something just really enjoy. 
so as an entrepreneur, what do you think your core strength is uh, in looking back? You know, I think just getting up and getting stuff done, I think I've always realized that, you know, and, <clears throat> you know, I've been investing for a while to, I think kind of like people skills and I've made a lot of mistakes in that as well, miserable mistakes. And I feel I keep getting better at it, kind of like trying to figure out um, people who can help us build things and execute. I think it's executing, man. Just like, you know, I've done everything from growth to product to raising capital. But I think at the end of the day, it really comes down to the ability to get something done, really get your hands dirty, actually, you know, and hopefully go in and also get out as quickly as you can and then allow other people to help them grow and also do stuff. And you sort of do this multiple times and then you see this sort of like group of people that are growing and thriving. And I think you just right there with them, you know, getting your hands dirty and enjoying the journey and hopefully growing with them. So I think that's really the, the most fun. Uh, so we're on at the end of the podcast. Uh, what is the best way for the you know listeners to reach out to you and you know find out more about Simplify? Uh, I mean, they can definitely go to uh, simplify.co, co, so S I M P L I F I D F I E D dot co, or they can also just find me on Twitter. You know, my um, last name Y A D A B A J A Y, my first name on Twitter, and reach out anytime. Thanks, Ajit. Thanks for taking time. Thank you, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you.